So I have already started discussing on this. Finite element method basically converts your PDE partial differential equation into a set of linear algebra equations. So most of the time in MOM also we have an integral differential equation. We convert that into a algebraic equation and try to solve it. So similar kind of thing we are doing here. So in the finite element method, you actually convert this PDE into a set of linear algebra equations. And uh, you want to find the approximate solution to a boundary value problem. So there will be some differential equation, then some boundary will be assigned. You want to solve those kind of equations, which are called boundary value problems. So finite element method has basically solved boundary value problem in two, two ways. One is called variational method, which, which, which we have already discussed. And we'll be discussing more also. This is the uh, most widely used finite element method. This is also called Rayleigh Ritz method because it was started by Rayleigh and uh, actually completed by Ritz. So this method is called variational method. This variational method we have already started discussing on that. We have already spent few hours, few lectures on that. So this start with the variational representation of the boundary value problems. So variational representation of the boundary value problem is your functional representation we have discussed in the last class. I will discuss it today also. Then there's another method which is called weighted residual method, which is just like your MOM. So there are two kinds of finite element method which are widely used. One is variational method. This is the most widely used. You can also do weighted residual method. There's a spelling mistake here. So weighted residual method is much similar to your MOM. So let's start with the variational method, which is the most popular one, really rich method. <clears throat> so here, as I have told you, to replace the problem of integrating a differential equation, you want to solve an integral equation, then what do you do? You do the integration, reverse of the differentiation. So in order to overcome that, we actually find an equivalent problem of seeking a function that gives a minimum value of some integral. So basically, that's what we call functional. No? We find an equivalent problem and we actually find an equivalent functional and try to minimize the functional and find a solution. That solution is exactly the same solution of your boundary value problem, which was a differential equation. So this type of problems of this type are called variational problems. As I have told you before also, Rayleigh started this in 1877 and extended by Rich in 1909. So it's also called Rayleigh risk method. But the actual finite element method is started by Corrin. You have studied about Corrin stability criteria in the finite difference time domain method, but he is the one who has originated finite element method. But whatever this approach we are considering, variational method is presented by Rayleigh in 1877 and Ritz completed it in 1909. So this is also called Rayleigh Ritz method or variational method. Why do we call it? Variational method because here we actually try to solve boundary value problem using using the calculus of variations. So I think this calculus of variations you usually learn it I think in the undergraduate in the, I think second semester or something like that. If I remember correctly, it's a long time now. <clears throat> so usually you learn this calculus of variations in the in your undergraduate second semester maybe. So what is calculus of variation? It's basically extension of your ordinary calculus. Here you basically, you are interested in solving maxima and minima of some function. So we use calculus of variation for finding the boundary value problems. So that's why it's called variational problem. We actually find the extrema. Extrema, it can be maxima or minima of an integral expression, which is also called as functional. Functional is another name for function of a function. We have discussed briefly in the last class. Let us see. Consider problem of finding a function phi x. We want to find this function phi x. So in order to find this function phi x, which is dependent on the x variable, x is the independent variable. We consider another function, which is called functional. So we want to find this function phi x. So to find this function phi x, we consider another functional which is defined like this. This functional is integral expression, range is from A to B, let's say. This is a function of a function, that's why 
capital F here is dependent on the dependent independent variable x as well as phi and first derivative of phi with respect to x dx. So this is a function of a function because this function is dependent on the function phi, which is a function of x. x is the independent variable. x is the only independent variable here we are considering. We'll extend it to three-dimensional case later on. Let's say there is a function phi x, which is dependent on the independent variable x, and we consider another functional capital F, which is dependent on x, phi, and phi dx. You integrate it over dx from a to b, that is your functional, which is denoted by i as a function of phi. We are actually interested in finding this phi. So in order to find that function phi, we consider th this functional here, which is an integral expression of a functional or function of a function. And uh, there is a boundary condition phi at A is equal to capital A, phi at B is equal to capital B. So this is a boundary value problem. So, <clears throat> so the integral is a given function of x, phi, and phi dash. Phi dash is the basically d phi by dx. So we call this i as a function of phi is called functional or variational principle. So this is also called as variational principle. So basically what we want to do is we want to extremize this function i as a function of phi. What is the value of extremizing function phi x such that i as a function of phi has an extrema. Extrema means maxima or minima. So here usually we consider minima because most of this functional turns out to be, you know, energy. So if we minimize the energy, we have an equilibrium. <coughs> so in order to do that, let us do properly, let us introduce an operator delta, which is called variational symbol. So delta will define it. The variation delta phi of this function phi is an infinitesimal change in phi. Delta phi means you are actually doing some small change in phi for a fixed value of this x. x is not changing. Delta x is zero, but we are actually in the phi x. So delta phi is some small change in phi when x is fixed, but phi is changing. So you know that the total differences of capital F, capital F is a function of x, phi, and phi there. So you know that if you want to define this uh, variation of capital F, which is a function of function, then you have to do variation of capital F with respect to x first, partial derivative, then dx, df by dx plus df by d phi. This is also another function. Here, df by d phi, d phi, plus df by d phi dx, d phi dx. This is a usual stuff you do in calculus. But in this case, we are actually fixing delta x equal to zero. We are not changing delta x. So delta x is zero, so this first term is zero. <clears throat> in that case, this delta f is equal to partial derivative. Term is zero because we assume that delta x is not changing. So this delta operator is very similar to your differential operator. So all the properties of differential operator will be satisfied by this delta operator. One necessary condition for i phi to have an extrema is delta i is equal to zero. If delta i is equal to zero, that's usually you find you know, any function you want to find maxima or minima, you equate it partially, you do partial derivative of that function with respect to uh, the variables and uh, you equate it to similar to that the necessary condition for this i phi to have a maxima or minima is delta i is equal to zero. Let ice x be an increment in phi x. Assume that ice x is a small increment in phi x. In order that boundary condition phi a is equal to a, phi b is equal to b is satisfied, ice a should be equal to zero, ice b should be equal to zero. So we are actually adding something to this phi x. And phi x was having boundary condition phi a is equal to a, phi b is equal to b. So when we add phi x with ice x, until and unless ice x is zero at a and b, this boundary condition is not going to satisfy. So phi is having a value of capital A at A, phi is giving, having a value of capital B at B. So when we add phi x plus ice x, the similar same boundary condition should be satisfied of the original problem. So in order to that, condition be satisfied, ice at A should be equal to zero, ice at B is equal to zero, like similar to what we have discussed in the last class. 
So now, in that case, the increment in I functional, delta I is I phi plus H minus I phi. So this is the original value of I at phi. Now we have increment this phi plus H. So I phi plus H minus I phi, that is the increment you have in I. I is the functional. So let us try to find this out, delta I, delta I. So here, what was the expression for I? I is integration from A to B dx of phi capital F at x phi comma phi dash. This is your I phi. So if I want to find I phi plus H, then capital F x comma phi plus H. So we'll replace this phi by phi plus H phi dash by phi dash plus H dash. Then you apply Taylor series expansion and just retain the first term. So when you do Taylor series expansion of this, then delta i will become summation uh, integration from a to b f phi h minus f phi ds h ds dx this would be the first term then you'll have high order terms from the Taylor series expansion so those high order terms you can neglect it since we have made this small increment h here so the high order terms of h like h square h cube and so on would be very small negligible so you can neglect it you can only consider the first order term so delta i in that case would be only this term here, which is from the Taylor series expansion. So far so good. Let's see. So now you do integration by parts, like in the last class, integration by parts. If I assume v is f phi dash x phi comma phi dash u is equal to h, then du will be h dash dx. So for the second term in the integration, so here the second term here, delta i was like this integration a to b this term then second term here the second term here i will use integration by parts assume b is this u is this then i use this formula for integration by parts integration b to u is called bu minus u dv so i do integration by parts for the second term then what i have is minus d by dx of see i have this term here integration of u dv what is u u is h dv this is b so dv would be del by del x of f phi dash x phi comma phi dash this second this term here is what we have here this term here is bu uh, what is u u is h b is this you integrate uh, you have uh, this bu here without any integration so x is going from a to b and we know that this h function is actually having a value of 0 at x is equal to a and 0 at x is equal to b. That's a boundary condition we have satisfied. So last discussion, no? In order this boundary condition to be satisfied, h a should be equal to 0, h b should be equal to 0. So if h at x is equal to a and b are 0, this term is going to become 0. So only this term will remain now inside the integration sign. So finally, the last term is 0, del i would be this integration and this whole term here. So what was the condition for finding the extremum? Delta i should be equal to zero. If we put delta i is equal to zero, then what we have is f phi minus d by dx of f phi dash equal to zero. So you can write in more compact form del phi, del f by del phi minus del by del x of f phi dash equal to zero. This was the Euler's equation we have derived in the last class. So you can also derive it in a very proper way using calculus of variation similar to what we have discussed today. This is also called Euler's Lagrange equation. So what we find out is delta i is equal to zero, then we got the Euler's equation. So the necessary condition for i phi, which is the functional to have an extremum for a given function phi x is phi x satisfy the Euler's equation. Euler's, people call it Euler's also, Euler's equations. So for the functional, we have a corresponding Euler equation to have maxima or minima. So the function phi x that gives minimum of the functional i, therefore satisfy the equation, which is called Euler equation. This was we have, we have derived today also in the last class also. Del f by del phi minus del by del x of del f by del phi there. So this was for the 1D case. Now, if you assume that this phi is dependent on x, y, and z, three variables in the three-dimensional case, in that case, the 3D form of the Euler's equation would be del f by del phi minus del by del x of del f by del phi x minus del by del y of del f by del phi y. 
minus del by del z of del f by del phi z equal to zero. This two additional term because of the dependent on the y and z independent variable of this phi function. Same to what, whatever we have done for the x uh, first case here. So we have considered only one phi is dependent only on x. You can extend it for y and z also. So you have four terms here. This is called the Euler equation. Let us take simple examples so that you understand what's going on. So you have a functional of this form, integration half phi x square phi y square minus f phi dx dy. Can you find out the Euler equations which will actually uh, maximize or minimize this functional here? So you try to find the Euler equations which will maximize or minimize this functional here. So most of the time it will minimize this functional here. So let us look at the integrand. Integrand is function of a function is dependent on both x and y, phi, phi x, phi y. And it is of the expression half phi x square phi y square minus f function which is dependent on x and y. Phi. So you find out the Euler equation. This was the Euler equ equation. Since this function, functional is dependent only on x and y independent variables, the last term won't be there, z dependent term won't be there. So we need to just find out this three term here. Del f by del phi, del f by del phi would be simply f function here. When you differentiate this function with respect to phi, these are independent of phi, this is dependent on phi. When you differentiate phi with respect to phi, you simply have this, minus f x comma y. This is the first term here. What is the second term? You actually have, the second term is del by del x of del f by del phi x. What is del f by del phi x? When you differentiate this function with respect to phi x, what you get is 2 phi x. 2 and 2 will cancel out 2 phi x, so you just simply have phi x. Then again, you differentiate with respect to x, you get phi x x. This is a double derivative of the phi function with respect to x. Similarly, if you want to find out this third term here, it is del f by del phi y. Del f by del phi y, when you differentiate it, this is the only term which is dependent on phi y, 2 phi y. 2 and half will cancel out, we simply have phi y, then you have partial derivative with respect to y again, so phi y y. So this is a partial derivative of phi with respect to y twice. So finally, your Euler equation is minus f minus phi xx minus phi yy is equal to zero, or you can rearrange the term, what you have is phi xx plus phi yy is equal to minus f x comma y. So this looks like your Poisson's, Poisson's equation, Poisson's equation, del square phi is equal to minus f x comma y. So if you have a functional of this form, then the Euler equation is the Poisson's equation. So if you have Poisson's equation, you can again find out what is the functional. So reverse process also you can do it. We'll discuss it also. So most of the time in the final element analysis, uh, the PD is given to you. You want to find out the solution of the PD, but in the calculus of uh, if you have a variational approach, you actually find a corresponding functional and minimize it. So that's the usual procedure. PD is given to you, partial differential equation is given to you. You find the corresponding functional and you try to minimize it. So how do I find a functional when PD is given? We'll try to find a functional or variational principle. It is also called as variational principle for a given differential equation. So how do we do it? It involves three, four steps. First, you multiply the linear equation. L phi is equal to F. L is the linear operator. Phi is the function and which you want to find f is the uh, some uh, initial value or some forcing function so usually this is also the Euler equation with the variational del, del phi so basically you multiply this linear equation with del phi of the independent variable phi and integrate it over the domain of the problem first thing is multiply this equation with del phi and integrate it then you use integration by parts to transfer the derivatives to the variation del phi then third step is express the boundary integral in terms of specified boundary condition. Then finally, bring the variational delta outside the integral. Then you will also, I will illustrate these four steps by taking one simple example. We want to find a functional or variation principle of the Poisson's equation. This was the Poisson's equation we have just discussed in the previous example. I want to find the variational principle or functional from this reverse process of what we have discussed now. So what do I do? I transfer all this term to the right hand side. So 
I transfer all this down to the right hand side. What I have is del square phi minus phi minus f x y is equal to zero. I transfer this also to the right hand side. Then I actually find delta i. Delta i is basically equal to double integration of minus del square phi minus f x comma y. Actually multiply delta phi with this uh, linear equation and integrate it over the independent variable dx dy. That was the first step I have just mentioned. So that's what we are doing here. So equal to what does so you separate this first term and second term here. What you get is minus double integration del square phi del phi dx dy minus double integration f as a function of x and y del phi dx dy. B d u you get b u minus integration of u d b. So hence the first term of delta i, this one, first term of delta i, you apply integration by parts, then what do you get? So when I do integration by parts of this first term here, which is minus del square phi, del phi, dx dy, it should be equal to, see what is del square phi? Del square phi means Laplacian of phi. Now we have only two independent variables, x and y, so del square phi will become minus phi x x plus phi y y. This is a double derivative of phi with respect to x and this double derivative of phi with respect to y. Then you already have del phi, then ds dy, so you separate this first term and second term. So write it equal to minus double integration phi x x del phi dx dy minus double integration phi y y del phi dx dy. And let us try to find out this. So now in order to find, you use integration by parts. Let's say if I want to find in double integration of phi x x del phi dx dy, then I use integration by parts. B du is equal to bu minus u db. So just consider b is equal to del phi. You just consider this is b. Du is del by del x of del phi by del x dx. That means phi x x dx. So this phi x x dx, I am considering this as du. Then u will be simply phi x. du is double differentiation. u will be simply phi x. dv, so dv of this would be del y del x of del phi dx. So this is what we have here. You use integration by parts. If I do integration by parts now, of this phi x is delta phi dx dy, taking v as del phi and u as phi x, then what I get is del phi, phi x minus phi x, del y del x of delta phi dx. Then we also have another integration dy. So I have done the integration, this portion here. Phi x as del phi dx, I also have another integration with respect to y. So this is what we have. Similarly, you can also do for phi y, y, del phi dx dy. Integration by parts, you consider B as del phi, du as del y, del y, del phi by del y, dy. Phi y, y, dy, u is del phi by del y is phi y, dv is del y, del y of del phi, dy. So very similar to the previous one. So when you do the integration by parts, what you get of this integration inside the third bracket, integration of phi y, y, del phi, dy is simply del phi, phi y minus integration phi y, del y, del y of del phi, del y. Then you also have another integration with respect to dx. Let us substitute that in the previous expression. You have del i will have terms like phi x, del y, del x, del phi, phi y, del y, del y, del phi minus. This was the term you have, second term of the original integration. So minus f x, y, del phi, dx, dy. Then uh, you also have terms like del phi, phi x dy minus, this, you should have only one minus here, del phi, phi y dx here. So look at this term here, this term, if you take out this delta outside, delta y2 common outside, then this looks like phi x square, phi y square. And since you have taken delta y2 outside, this will become simply 2 f phi. If you take out delta here, then you get phi, phi x dy, Again, take out delta here, phi, phi, y, dx. So this is delta i, delta i. So
zero at the two ends. Two ends and the uh, Newman boundary condition actually says that phi x is and phi y, this derivative with respect to x and y is actually zero at the two ends. So this phi will also be zero phi x and phi y will also be zero depending on any of these boundary conditions. So phi is zero at two ends, let's say a and b, then this integration and this integration would also be zero. If another condition, Newman boundary condition, phi x is zero or phi y is zero at the two boundary condition, then this also will become zero. So finally what you have here is del times delta times this term here. So what is this term whole thing here? This is delta i. So delta i, this whole thing is the i. i now becomes simply half phi x square phi y square minus 2 f phi dx dy. So this is how you get the variational principle. Whenever I have a Poisson's equation, del square phi is equal to minus f x comma y, you transfer all this term to the right hand side why I'm doing this, I'll show you later on. Transfer this to the right hand side also minus del square phi minus f x y is equal to zero. Then the corresponding functional would be of the form double integration half phi x square phi y square minus two f phi dx dy. So this is what we get. So you can even generalize it. You can even generalize it. This Poisson's equation, let on you can generalize it for in inhomogeneous wave equation also. Del square phi plus k squared phi is equal to g. So if I have a equation, Euler equation of the form del square phi plus k square phi plus g, not something like del square phi is equal to minus f x comma y, is a Poisson's, Poisson's equation, then this is actually inhomogeneous wave equation. This is the most generalized wave equation. From there you can deduce many particular cases like I have told in the last class. So if I have all the equations of the form del square phi plus k square phi is equal to g. In that case, what should be my functional? So as I've told you, transfer all this thing to the right hand side. Transfer this to the right hand side. What you get is del square phi minus k square phi plus g equal to zero. So this equation and this equation is very similar. You have minus del square phi. And instead of f, you have plus g. Minus f, you have g here and you have one extra term here minus k square phi. So what should be functional? You can do the similar kind of derivation and I will just write down the functional for this half integration of del phi square, just like this. This is del phi square. You have minus k square phi here also, minus k square phi square it will become. Then this g, here it was minus f, then you have minus 2f g, but now this is plus g here, so 2 phi g. Yes. So what we are getting is simply del phi square minus k square phi square plus 2 phi g. Yes. So this is a functional for the most general wave equation in homogeneous wave equation. So once you have this functional here, you can apply it for many applications, wave guide, wave equation, many kind of applications, Poisson's equation, Laplace equation, all these equations you can apply. Okay, how much time do I have? Okay, and let me just start this discussion. So let us apply this variational principle and try to find out finite element analysis of transmission line. A transmission line, everybody knows, transmission line is basically a two conductor line. And inside the transmission line, you have TEM waves propagation. So for TM waves, you need two conductors. WebGuide doesn't have two conductors. It has only one conductor. So it will allow only T or TM waves. It doesn't have any kind of TM waves. Coaxial cable has two conductors. So you have TM waves. So transmission lines are actually two conductor lines. So here we are considering one particular case where transmission line is open circuited. You have a source here of, of voltage B0. We have put it at Z is equal to L. You have a source of B0. And at z is equal to zero, you have a load, RL, which is tending to infinity. That means open circuited. This is open circuited load here. You have a source here, which is actually feeding signal to this transmission line, and you have open circuit here. At z is equal to zero, source is located at z is equal to L. So you can use telegraphers equations to solve this kind of transmission line, and I think transmission line is known to all of you. So del by 
del i by del z. i is the current density. Don't get confused with our functional we defined just now. So i is a function of z and t. Del by del z of current equal to minus c del v by del t. So this is telegraph, famous telegraphers equation. When you do partial derivative of i respect to z, you get minus c del v by del t. When you do partial derivative of b with respect to z, what you get is minus l del i by del t. You can use telegraphers equation and solve the wave equation and find out what is the wave propagating inside the transmission line. But now we want to use finite element method and solve the uh, problem of transmission line. So in the frequency domain, frequency domain del, by, del i by del z is equal to minus c. So basically, if you consider time harmonic field, so all the time derivatives will be replaced by j omega. So minus j omega c b. Del b by del z is equal to minus j omega i. So now if I actually differentiate this 1 by l, put 1 by l. Again, differentiate this. You multiply this by 1 by l and differentiate it with respect to z. Multiply by 1 by l, so l and l will cancel out. You differentiate with respect to z, del i by del z. So when you multiply by 1 by l in the left hand side and differentiate with respect to z, what you get in the right hand side is minus j omega del i by del z. Del i by del z has this expression here. You substitute it. Finally, what you get is double derivative of 1 by L, double derivative of voltage with respect to Z is equal to minus omega square CV. So this is actually your wave equation. So you transfer this omega square CV to the left hand side and you multiply this L to the right hand side and transfer this whole term to the left hand side. What you have is del by del Z, dv by dz is equal plus omega square LCB is equal to zero. So this is your wave equation. From here you can find out the waves but we'll try to use finite element method and try to solve this PDE, partial differential equation. Del square by del z square dz plus omega square lcb equal to zero. So this is a boundary value problem. We have the boundary condition b at z is equal to l is b naught. And this is what you have source here. What is the voltage at this location z is equal to l, b naught. What is the current here? This is open circuited, so current is zero. So what is the boundary condition? I at z is equal to zero equal to dv by dz equal to zero. So this is another boundary condition. So we are actually trying to solve the boundary value problem for the transmission line. This is a wave equation along with the boundary conditions. You can usually use such kind of PD. You can use a finite number method and solve it. So we'll try the variational approach. In the variational approach, we have derived today in Euler's equation, if you have some equation of the form del square 5 plus k square, phi is equal to g, what is the functional? Corresponding functional is half double integration del phi square minus k square phi square plus 2 fg ts. Let us just try to deduce this functional for our uh, Euler equations, which is the equation of the wave on a transmission line 1 by L del square by del Z square of B plus omega square CV is equal to zero. What was the first step? You transfer all this thing to the right hand side. So minus 1 by L del square B Z by del Z square minus omega square CV is equal to zero. Then compare this equation and find out the functional. The functional would be of the form 1 by L del B by del Z square minus omega square CV square DZ. Half time integration on that. So this is the functional. We have the functional. We have a functional, then we can apply finite element methods and uh, solve this equivalent problem from the functional. So this is uh, integrand. Integrand was half 1 by L dv by dz square minus omega square cv square. What is dl by dv? dl by dv, so this is a capital F. You do partial derivative respect to b, what do you get? Minus omega square cv, this term, yeah? minus omega square. CB. Two will come out, but this two and half will cancel out. What is dA by dBz? dA by dBz is 1 by L. Look at this term here, 1 by L, dB by dz. Go to 1 by L, bz. So that's your Euler equation. So Euler equation for this, PDA for this is this. This is what we want to solve. So I'm just checking whether I'm getting the PDE as the original problem, which is the wave equation of the transmission line. So I'm just verifying whether the functional is giving me the accurate PDE, which is the order from the using the Euler's equation. 
So the, it's a way of equation for the transmission method. Your functional you can also express in terms of Li square plus half Cv square minus half omega square Li square plus Cv square dz by doing a simple derivation since you have i as minus 1 by g omega L dv by dz. You substitute that, then you can find out that the functional is actually looking like you know stored electric field and magnetic field. This is the stored electric field, this is the stored magnetic field. And this is a stored electric field. Capacitor stores the electric energy and inductor stores the magnetic energy. So the final expression is actually looks like your stored electric field and the stored magnetic field. So your functional is basically related to the energy storage. Okay, I let me see whether I have time. Okay, I have 10 minutes time. So what is the first step? You approximate the voltage for every element lying between, let's say if you consider any arbitrary element lying between ZL and ZR. See, this basically transmission line is a one dimensional structure. Z is the variable which is running through the transmission line. Uh, so you consider any uh, element between ZL and ZR, any arbitrary element between ZL and ZR, you, you can consider that as one small element of the finite element analysis. So in the 2D case, we have considered triangular element. Here we'll consider line segments at the element. For this line segment between ZL to ZR, you can actually have an approximate voltage. BE for this element E is alpha Z BL plus alpha R BR. What is alpha L? Alpha L and alpha R are the shape functions or interpolation functions. This alpha L is defined as ZR minus Z, sorry, divided by ZR minus ZL. And alpha R is defined as Z minus ZL divided by ZR minus ZL. So this looks like equation of line with a negative slope. This also looks like a equation of line with positive slope. So you assume that this transmission line of length L is discretized into N elements, capital N elements, and every segment has a length of S E is equal to 1 by capital N. So this diagram will further illustrate that. This is the interpolation function. Alpha L is a line with a negative slope. Alpha R is a line with a positive slope. This is the expression for alpha L and alpha R. This is ZL, this is ZR. So you can assume that alpha L plus alpha R, this alpha L is having a value of 1 at this ZL and alpha R is having a value of 1 at this ZR. This is the one segment of length I see. So you can substitute the approximate voltage in the functional. What was the functional? Functional was of the form half ZL. So now in this case, you can approximate the functional in the half ZL to ZL R, 1 by L, dV by dz whole square minus omega square CV square dz. So functional over that small element, line segment element, is a function of B is of the form like this. This is the functional expression. So since you are considering only a segment, line segment, this will go from zero to gel R. I think I should stop here. We'll discuss the other things in the next class.